Our lay speaker today is one of our new friends to the church, Dorothy Brooks. In the early 1980s and again in the late 90s, Dorothy taught New Mexico elementary school grades on the Navajo Nation in Shiprock and at Zuni Pueblo, as well as Native University students. She was nominated in 2014 for a National Pushcart Prize by Hippocampus Magazine, in which she won both first prize and People's Choice Awards for her Res stories in its annual independent press competition. Her poetry chapbook, Swamp Baby, was published by Finishing Line Press in 2012, and her historical family memoir, A Certain Sadness, by Chapbook Press in 2015. One of Dorothy's long-standing interests is conflict resolution. While living in New Mexico, she was instrumental in initiating a community dispute resolution center in a town bordering the Navajo Nation, an effort which later became part of a restorative justice program. She also started a peer mediation project with her fifth grade students, who became good at solving playground disputes with their newly acquired skills. Later, back in Michigan, she was a volunteer mediator with district courts in Lansing and East Lansing. She moved to the Kalamazoo area about five years ago. A photograph exhibit along the art wall extends the stories that Dorothy will share. It gives a visual account of her experiences on the Navajo Nation. The exhibit starts at the far bulletin board with the background to her photos. Welcome, Dorothy. We're delighted to hear from you. Good morning. Thank you, Kimberly. Appreciate that. So my opening question today is, why on earth would a 40-something single white Midwesterner plop herself down sight unseen 2,000 miles away to teach on the Navajo Nation in Shiprock, New Mexico? Well, that person was I. And given the current divides in our country, lately I've been thinking a lot about that experience. But back to the question, the why for me was decided long before I actually went. As a little girl tagging along when daddy went fishing, we'd sometimes come across an arrowhead in the sand blows along the river. Although we weren't native, he would hold one of those flints in the palm of his hand with such genuine wonder about its maker, its craftsmanship, and its beauty. Somehow I was able to sense that, and I knew for sure when I grew up that I wanted to learn more about Indians. So now to a second question. Why am I standing up here about to share some stories with you that I wrote about experiences I had 40 years ago. That's for us, hopefully, to discover. But first, just a few considerations. Talk about balance. Native Americans of today want to be regarded as current, as vital, productive individuals and tribal members. For example, Deb Holland, Laguna Pueblo, our current Secretary of the Interior, or astronaut Nicole Mann, Wallachie of the Round Valley Indian Tribes, or former Olympic gold medalist, excuse me, gold medalist, Billy Mills, Oglala Sioux Tribe, in town just a couple months ago, speaking at Western Michigan University. And of course, there are many more. Two, my stories detail only my own one person's experience, and so I do not begin to profess to give a comprehensive account of, reser excuse me, microphone, of reservation life. It's only what I saw in front of and around me in my particular moments there over the course of six or seven years. Next, I should mention that any names have been changed intentionally 
Two, I would respectfully ask that no photos of my related exhibit over there be taken because of copyright and cultural considerations. Thanks. Finally, and certainly not least, my gratitude to publishers of a decade ago when my stories came out, Weber, the Contemporary West, and also Hippocampus Magazine for running my stories and related photos and to TLAA, a collective of indigenous expression, which was a student journal at New Mexico State University for publishing several of my photos shown in this accompanying exhibit. And to those of you within our community, oh my goodness, for intrepid help mounting that first half of the show, for being willing to help with the table set up, for sharing helpful display hints, for feedback on the initial setup, and this morning for pitching in and getting the last half of the exhibit up smoothly and in time. My eternal gratitude. So now let's get to the stories. These stories are from Fickle Friend the Wind, Trying to Blend In on the Res, in the midst of skyscrapers. The sharp ring of the phone made me jump as I studied at my desk in my high-rise dorm at Columbia University in New York. I had completely forgotten my application to teach in Shiprock, which I'd sent out the previous Christmas with a batch of others. I wasn't really expecting a reply. Picking up the phone, I heard a man's sparse voice lean on words in fragments over the crackly connection. We need a kindergarten teacher. Can you come? The room suddenly dropped away as the memory of my application flooded me. When? I stammered. School started Monday. I glanced out my window where sometimes roiling flames rose from nearby Harlem. I was already worlds away from my own small town in Michigan. But I heard myself saying, if I get there as soon as I can, do I still have a job? It seemed impossible to pull off, but I knew I wanted to grab it. I get a leave from my teaching job at home and ease out of my apartment lease. Yes, he said as the phone connection cut off. Two days later, I was stuck on the tarmac at JFK Airport because of an air controller's strike. When my plane finally took off, but for a quick stop home to gather some belongings in my car, I was already heading west. First day reality check. On my first morning at school, Kids were zigzagging everywhere on the playground. I threaded my way through a mass of elementary school children with their glossy black hair and deep brown eyes that quickly looked away from my smiles. Inside, the principal, a white man with measured restraint, showed me to my kindergarten room. Gazing out the window was the Navajo teacher aide with whom I would work. I had a thousand questions, but before I knew it, she had disappeared. Then the bell clanged full volume, and immediately in the doorway appeared silent as stone five-year-olds. They edged tightly against the back wall as far away from me as they could get, that is, with the exception of Chunky Jackson. Beautiful black hair streaming down to his waist, he anchored himself in the hall just outside our door and bawled, no, howled, nonstop. I could not coax him inside. Back home, my kindergarten class had slathered me with grins, hugs, sometimes tears, and unabashed laughter. But these children sat and watched. Up in front, 
I sang like a Broadway star, did clever action rhymes. I invited, I cajoled, I was a one-person act, and I bombed. The kids wouldn't even look at me, nor would the aide who had slipped back in and joined them. Mercifully, the school buses finally appeared in full view beyond our window, and my students came to life. In the jostling, I did the usual, trying to restore a little order. Instantly, the whole class, plus the aide, broke into laughter. Why? More importantly, what kids went on which buses? There were no street signs or house numbers in Shiprock, and Jackson still bellowed in the hallway. The aide saved the day. At the last minute, she was able to take him by the arm, and with all the others, they left. Running outside to join them, I couldn't find anyone in the swarm of kids that I recognized. All I could do was cross my fingers that my students were on the right buses. <clears throat> Excuse me, lonesome sheep in old pond. The first time I needed groceries and headed for a trading post in Shiprock, seven or eight bleeding sheep from an attached corral greeted me. I did a double take. Live sheep? What were they doing there? Evidently, they were for sale, pawn, or trade. I never knew, but I always felt a sharp pang because I guess they were probably headed for mutton stew. In actuality, they were the lifeblood of the res, for food, for weaving, as an indication of the matriarch of the family's wealth. And what other crop could be raised on that unforgiving landscape? Inside the trading posts seemed a foreign land to me. No high shelves that required stretching. There were simply sparse makeshift ones at waist length with a mix of anything that could be essential to Navajo life, penny nails, horse tack, cast iron skillets. Once I located my cans of tomato soup and tuna, I would work my way past the 50 pound cotton bags of fry bread flour embellished with a red rose logo, the big chief writing tablets and head straight for the back of the store. Behind a counter were stacked bolts of fabric for traditional clothing, jewel velveteens, shiny satins, calicoes. There were large skeins of wool for weaving and counters of vintage turquoise jewelry, most tagged as dead pawn, meaning the time limit to be reclaimed by payment from the original owner had expired, so it now was available to sell to the public. It was often of museum quality. On the far wall, a curtain door led to the rug room where the Navajo women brought their weavings to sell to the trader. I could only glimpse, excuse me, I could only catch glimpses of stacked rugs, but their patterns were dazzling. Then it was through the checkout counter with its round tins of chewing tobacco, another res staple. I would smile and say hello to the woman there though I was met with silence in return. But the sheep felt otherwise. Once I reappeared outside, they couldn't stop bleating. Smart sheep, they had me pegged, a regular bleeding heart. They were right. Over the mountains and lost in language. <clears throat> To my complete surprise, one day at school, a teacher aide approached me and asked if I would go along as a chaperone for a group of students from our school when they were to compete in a traditional song and dance contest. It was to be a full day at what was then known as Navajo Community College in Siley, Arizona, now Diné, the People College, not far across the state line. Of course, I said, happy to be asked to be part of something anything. I had no idea what it was, but if it was a school event, no problem. Several weeks later, on a brisk Saturday morning, we filled a school bus for the all-day trip. Everyone, the Navajo teachers, aides, the 20 or so students, was resplendent in traditional clothing and fine turquoise jewelry. 
At the last minute, discovering that that was the dress for the day, I had patched together a rather hokey outfit, a velvet top I just happened to have, and a summer paisley skirt, which did not add to my feelings of blending in. Nevertheless, off we chugged up and over Washington Pass, now Narbona Pass, high in the Chuska Mountains, with this magnificent view of Shiprock and the San Juan Basin fanning out below. The forests of Ponderosa, spruce, and fir were balm for my soul, and I drew in their aroma through the bus window like a camel discovering an ocean. It took my mind off the fact that I was the only Belagana white person on the bus. Bus driver, adults, kids, all were speaking Navajo, and in fact did so for the entire day. I had expected that, but just before the students piled off the bus and an aide stood at the front to give directions, I realized I was in trouble. What was she telling them? What was my part for the day? Before I knew it, everyone was off the bus and I was scrambling to keep up. The college campus was lovely. Its grounds were a circular design, true to Navajo tradition, and it offered a full curriculum in Navajo language and culture. Then it hit me. Every single sign showing locations and names for the various buildings was in Navajo, only Navajo. How would I even stay with my group? None of my own students had come along, and I sat toward the back of the bus and only saw the backs of heads. Most I wouldn't recognize again. Luckily, I caught up with the one face I recognized, the aide who had asked me to come along. She was completely involved, giving directions and herding students to risers in a large gymnasium with a stage. My survival plan was to keep her in sight regardless. For a moment, it flashed across my mind that I would never be able to find a restroom for the entire day. Then the contest started. It was a respectful audience, filled with groups from schools across the reservation, I assumed. Several at a time, students would file up to the stage and sing traditional songs or chants. Sometimes it would be one child alone, singing with no accompaniment except a small drum in hand. Several groups from our school performed traditional dances to music on a tape by a tape recorder, which they had practiced earlier at school. I felt washed with pride. As the morning unfolded, no one grew restless. All those kids paid strict attention to the ones on stage. I was struck by the simple beauty of it, how fortunate those children were to be enfolded by such a rich, enduring culture. And then it was time for lunch. Long lines of tables were set up in a big cafeteria, and we all sat facing each other. Everyone was speaking Navajo. I tried to keep a pleasant smile on my face, but my cheek muscles eventually began to ache. Bowls of stew were served us individually, along with a Navajo taco. I had already discovered the tacos made with fry bread at Shiprock's one fast food stop, and I knew they were delicious. But then there was the stew, traditional stew, mutton stew. I took one look at the globs of grease floating on its surface. The chunks of meat looked dishwater gray. I could hear the corralling sheep ah, at the trading post bleeding at me like, no, tomorrow. Everyone around me dove in. Nausea rose to my tonsils. Buy some time, I told myself, buy time. So I stirred my stew. And I stirred, and I stirred some more, trying not to look down. Others were emptying their bowls, and the clock was ticking. Finally, I glanced at my stew again, and there was a knuckle bone sticking out. Nothing left to do but start. I managed to get the broth down without choking, but it coated my throat like Vaseline, slippery and thick. Three bites, I decided. Just conquer three bites. I wasn't sure what my spoon took to my mouth, 
I didn't look, and I didn't want to know. At that point, everyone else was done, and I didn't dare get left behind. So I maneuvered the remaining chunks of stew underneath a little tripod of bones I made in the bowl to hide them and called it good. Well, as good as it was going to get. Heading back to the gym for the full afternoon of more performances, I was rewarded for facing down the stew by a gaggle of little girls ahead of me who suddenly ducked in a doorway. Taking a chance, I followed them having no idea what the Navajo sign on the door said. To my huge relief, it was a women's restroom. Spider crawl. One evening about dusk, I was doing lesson plans in my school housing trailer, sitting at my table, a turned over cardboard box topped with a brown glass bottle found along the road. Some sagebrush stuck in it made a bouquet. As I sat in my chair, my folding lawn chair I brought with me from home, I felt a strange pull just beyond the nape of my neck. There was no question that I was there alone, but my entire being felt as if someone was watching me. Slowly glancing over my shoulder, my gaze froze on a smallish black spot on the beat up paneling about three feet above my head. It was moving in slow motion, methodically lifting one delicate black leg after another, inching towards me. I jerked. From the angle I was looking, I could clearly see it was not just an ordinary spider. On its underside, I glimpsed the notorious red fiddle mark of a black widow. I'd never seen one in my life, but I knew its markings and its reputation. When I finally gathered my wits enough to grab a paper to swat it, it had lightly glided off as though I had only imagined its presence. Now there were two of us living in my trailer. That night I left all the lights on. I lay rigid, my eyes checking each groove of the paneling, the ceiling tiles, the bare floor around my sleeping bag and its thin foam mattress then back again and again. Next day at school, still shaken, I asked the school nurse what to do. She snorted, then shrugged and said, I should just shake out my shoes each morning like everyone else did, or put my bedposts in stew cans filled with water so spiders couldn't get to my bed. But I didn't have any bedposts since my mattress rested flat on the floor. Each morning, I shook my shoes out as if they had hundred-dollar bills stuck in them. But the spider remained elusive, gambling on her own game. Amateur Hour As the days and weeks of my new job melded into December, it was time for our entire school to file into the gym for an assembly. Each class was to go up in front and sing a few songs. My still shy kindergartners and I had prepared a rather muted rendition of the people on the bus go up and down and my nerves were working overtime. What if I couldn't show all those watching eyes that I could teach, that I could manage my kids? But our song went without incident and I wished I could hug each kid for doing well, which was simply not done. I'd learned to lasso in my usual froth of enthusiasm weeks ago, trying to match the more composed behavior of the Navajo adults around me. As we turned to leave, one of my students, Roxy, with the sparkling eyes and who was always bursting with raw motion, bounded out of line and on to center stage, claiming it as her own. Just beyond my arm's reach, she turned her back to the sea of faces in the audience, promptly stuck out her little behind and pulled down her jeans. Wearing no underwear and quicker than a rabbit, she mooned them all. There was surprised silence 
And then, like lightning, she bolted for the playground exit door. The principal never missed a beat. He was one gallop behind her. The rest of the afternoon, there was no word about her. The Navajo teacher aide seemed silent about all of it. My very skin felt stretched with worry. Finally, after getting the kids on the bus to go home, I made a quick pass by the office. My principal said it had taken two hours to locate Roxy. She had wiggled herself far into a tight space between the tires of another teacher's trailer several blocks over from mine. The principal made no comment on our performance, but briefly mentioned FAS, fetal alcohol syndrome. At the time, I'd never heard of it. Later, I learned it was related to alcohol intake by a woman during pregnancy, and that could result in a broad range of behavioral and learning challenges in her child. And of course, it was not unique to the reservation. It took, my principal said with a slight smile, strawberry ice cream to get her to come out. One morning, I discovered a scruffy cardboard box, a shoe box, sitting on my desk, evidently left by one of my fifth graders. And this note to me, and by the way, the original is over there on the table. The note says, Dear Miss Brooks, I will miss you over the summer, and I hope you don't get hurt or I hope nothing bad is going to happen to you. And there are a lot of special things in that box and I want you to keep them forever and ever because you are my teacher and I, and she drew a little heart, love you. You have been the greatest teacher I ever had because you are the only one that lets me paint when the other kids go outside and all the other teachers say, you have to go right outside now. But when I'm outside, I can't play with anybody because everybody I know is with their friends. Well, anyway, I hope you like the stuff inside. In the box were three things. Wrapped in newspaper. Planky Slinky. Oh, excuse me, microphone. I've never apologized to a microphone before. I've done it twice this morning, I observe. And this. Pretend that's a drum in the distance beating like I used to hear there. The remnant of tin foil wrapped a half-eaten chocolate Hershey bar. And so my gifts have been so plentiful from these children, including the exuberant joy bouncing from the table over there, which displays a whole row of their self-portraits drawn in colored markers without a moment's hesitation. But yet another gift from them is my hope this morning that their stories might remind us that regardless of era or deep divisions or culture, that children always have a lesson for us, that our innate biases can be freed by our human qualities and offer always the potential for building bridges. Thank you. Thanks.